Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's workshop, Teachable Moments at Home for Our Littlest Learners. I'm Cecilia Zalkin, President and CEO of Advocates for Children of New Jersey. And this workshop is a continuing partnership between ACNJ and the Institute for Families at the Rutgers School of Social Work. We hope that you find the information, tools, and techniques from this workshop useful as many of us prepare to go into, hard to believe, our seventh month at home, many with young children. I'm especially excited about this workshop because as we've looked at the impact of COVID-19 on children, uh, a lot of attention is focused on school-age children, um, not as much on our littlest learners, those of preschool age or even younger, children who depend on early learning environments for their education. Um, and I, I'm excited to hear some of what will come out in this workshop about how we can, families can help maintain that learning at home as well. Um, let me tell you a, br a brief bit about ACNJ. ACNJ is the largest policy advocacy organization in the state. We advocate on behalf of children through research, policy analysis, and advocacy with our state um, and national leaders to make sure that children are top on the agenda. Our mission is to ensure that every child grows up safe, healthy, and educated. Um, this year, we have a, a growing campaign looking at children from prenatal to age three. Our Think Babies work has set a, an ambitious agenda for our youngest children. And because of the impact of COVID, we've also focused a great deal of that agenda in the last few months on childcare, making sure that our childcare system is supported and sustained to provide both care for working parents as well as high quality early education opportunities for young children. Um, two things that I'll mention. First of all, if you're interested in alerts from ACNJ, please sign up. We'll provide information to you. Um, the link is in the chat box. Um, and two action items I'd like to bring to your attention. Uh, it is not too late to fill out the census form. This has been a, a campaign of ACNJ and many organizations across the state to make sure that New Jersey is fully counted in the 2020 census. Uh, this is something you need to do individually if you haven't done it already, or with your friends, families, to make sure that everybody is counted this year. And second, I want to announce that yesterday, in partnership with a number of other organizations, including the Nicholson and Terrell Foundations, as well as the New Jersey chapter of NAEYC, we launched a childcare campaign called Reimagine Childcare. Uh, if nothing else, this pandemic, I think, has raised public awareness about the critical importance of childcare to children, to families, and to our state our economy. And I'm excited about this campaign. There'll be information where you can sign up in the chat box as well. So today, joining me are facilitators Newson Robinson, who is the program manager at the Institute for Families at the Rutgers School of Social Work. Welcome, Newson. And Cindy Terabush, who's the author of Teach the Whole Preschooler, Strategies for Nurturing Developing Minds, and is the co-host of the podcast, How Preschool Teachers Do It. We're gonna open the workshop with a short movie clip, then we'll ask you to do a quick survey. And then finally, Newton and Cindy will take over, introduce themselves, and facilitate the presentation. There'll be a short question and answer period at the end, but please feel free to share questions in the chat box. We'll be monitoring that, comments, or if you have information to share. We have found that the educational forums we have hosted and co-hosted um, have brought people together to exchange ideas. Not as easy as meeting in person, but still something we can do. So please use the chat box for any comments, questions, that you have. And finally, <clears throat> this workshop is being recorded and you'll be able to find it both on the ACNJ website, acnj.org, and on the Rutgers Institute for Families website as well. We'll put that in the chat box too. Welcome again, and I just want to extend a, a thank you to the Rutgers Institute for partnering with us. You have certainly brought a wealth of information um, to families and we're, we're very excited to have had this partnership. So thank you. Let me turn it over to the movie clip.
the early years of a child's life are very important for his or her health and development. Teachable moments can be a part of the daily interactions we have with young children. This could be through building caring and trusting relationships that provide love and safety, and having meaningful conversations with children no matter what their age. It's making the most of moments that are part of your day-to-day and working with what you have and where you are to find small interactions that make a big difference. Hi everyone. So the reason we wanted to kick it off with that video is to really talk about what teachable moments are since that is the title of this webinar and we're really excited excited about it. So thank you Seal and thank you AC&J for this partnership. So I'm Nuthan Rubinson. I'm the program manager at the Institute for Families at the Rutgers School of Social Work. But more importantly, I'm the mother to two boys, ages 11 and five. Um, here's their you know, very formal portrait, as you can see. And I'm joined by my awesome co-panelist here, Cindy Terabush. And along with being an author and having a podcast, she's also had 20 years of experience in the field of education specifically with teaching, director, directing, and all of it. So she's going to be um, a great resource here for lots of ideas around activities for finding those teachable moments. So what we want to do is actually kick it off with a poll to get to know a little bit more about who's joined us today through the ages of the children for whom you care. So you're going to see a poll come up. And really what we'd like you to do is just check off the ages of the children within your care as the parent or caregiver. And that'll give us an idea of what kind of ages your children are. And Cindy's gonna be able to use that information as she's going through some of the activity ideas to really then customize it to who we have on today. So you should see that poll coming up now and you can do that directly in the poll. We're just going to give you a little bit of time to start checking those off. You can see we've got everything from the young infants starting with birth all the way through the pre-K age. And while we're waiting for that to come in, I'm going to mention that like Nuth and I also am a parent. Um, my children are young adults now. So I've sort of come out the other side of the parenting thing, though it never ends. Ah, here are the results. That's a pretty even, almost an even split of age groups. Great. It really is, and that's great. I, I think that as we go through the activity ideas, what you'll find is that they really take you then through the birth to preschool, um, you know, really based on the same foundational ideas, but really just differing upon those ages. So thank you for sharing that. That's gonna be really helpful as we go. So there's no other way to say it other than that these times are really hard. And throughout that, you're considering so many things as a parent and a caregiver, family, health, work, safety. And you may also be wondering about how you support your child's development, no matter if they are in an early child care and education program or if they're home. And so what we wanna share here today with you is really that the best thing that parents and caregivers can do is find those teachable moments throughout the day using the things at your home and then also finding meaningful interactions. And what we're going to start with is just kick it off with just talking about four concepts around child development. So this first one you can see here on the slide, it says hands-on multi-sensory experiences. So what does that mean? In other words, it means play with them. Children learn best through learning and playing and being active with you. 
So consider, you know, when I'm playing with my five-year-old and we're pretending to have an ice cream shop, for example, that that's an opportunity for him to get curious, focus his attention and problem solve. The next concept you'll see is really the importance around those relationships and interactions with the important adults in a child's life. Those interactions build development and build those skills. But the important thing to remember about those interactions is that they can be unplanned and they happen throughout the day. So my meaningful interaction might start at 6 a.m. when I'm giving my little one a huge hug. And that interaction is important and it will take us through that day. The next concept is really from everything from baby talk to questions and conversations with preschoolers. Talking really is teaching. And that those actions can happen through simple everyday areas like going for a walk outside and pointing out the things you see, or maybe even singing together during bedtime or bath time. And then this last concept. So if you've ever given a young child a gift, you know how they open it up, push the gift aside, and then play with the box. The reason they do that is because the simplest toys are sometimes and mostly the best toys. And I mean really simple, like the things you find around the house. And so thinking of those household items, those are opportunities for a caregiver or a parent to play and explore and discover with their children. And so what you'll see is we actually pulled together a group of these different items so if you look on this next page, we've got some everyday items for at-home learning activities. You know, everything from these toilet paper tubes, which I find all over my house that can be used as tunnels or building blocks. And then everything from how to use ice cubes and water. And so we are providing this resource along with others on a resource page that we'll be sharing with you in the chat. So this is something you can hang on to and start using it to build your own treasure chest or toolbox of these everyday items. And you'll see they have some important health and safety considerations as well to keep in mind. So what we're gonna do now is we're actually gonna walk through four areas of development, social emotional, language, cognitive, and physical and motor development. And with each of these, we're gonna quickly talk about what it is, how it forms, but then really the most important piece is talk about those activities that you can do with your child from birth to preschool using the items that you have in your home. So we'll start off with social emotional. And as we go, please feel free to put those thoughts and questions in the chat or in the Q&A. So starting off with social and emotional, that's all about the emotions and the relationships. And when with those relationships, especially when they're with adults, it's talking about the trust and safety and security that's coming through those. And this is, of course, especially important during these uncertain times. Social emotional development includes a number of skills that children need to succeed in their world. And often these are the skills that we want children to be doing very, very young, but all learning is a process. Just like learning to read or write is a process, so is learning socialization and learning about emotions. Sharing is something that takes children time, for example. They aren't born able to share with other people. You know, when they're really young, one of the first words that they really master is the word mine. Every time they want or need or hold something and we go to reach for it, they yell, mine, mine. That's because they're learning about what it feels like to have something. And that's what they have to learn first. Once they know that when they have something, if someone else uses it or it's sitting on a shelf over there, it doesn't mean you'll never get it back again. Then they can learn to take turns. And once they learn that if they take turns with someone, that they'll get it back again, maybe in the future, then they can learn to work cooperatively with people. And that sharing folks, in case you're struggling with children with sharing, it may make you feel a little better to know that sharing is something that we don't really expect to see children doing on their own until somewhere around maybe end of pre-K kindergarten, if things are going well, 
And I think that and teamwork are things that we work on our entire lives. I don't think we ever get done learning how to get along with others, how to share, and how to be part of a team. It's a lifelong lesson. Teamwork, it's kind of like sharing. You know, it's somewhere around the mid pre-K year that I'll be walking around to school and students will call me into a classroom to see the big tower that they built together as a team. I don't see that happening before pre-K. And there are some children who need some more time beyond that. All learning takes children different amounts of time depending on their experiences, their personality, and their ability to cope with their emotions. Separation anxiety is something that we should expect in the early childhood years. Again, perfectly normal and typical development for children to be attached to someone and to need that person there in order to feel free to explore and feel safe. And then what they do is they develop multiple attachments. So they're attached first to their to the people at home, and then they'll attach to the people at school, and it begins to expand. But all of these skills really do depend on a child's ability to understand their emotions and the emotions of others, and to cope with their own emotions and the emotions of others. So let's take a look at some activities that you can do at home without any fancy equipment to promote that emotional development and which will help them to socialize. First, you need to be talking with them about feelings. This is hard for a lot of adults. Sounds easy, much more difficult to do. And the reason that it's difficult is that we didn't, many of us, myself included, didn't grow up with the knowledge of how important this is. And so in our families of origin, we didn't talk much about feelings. I am from a generation where my parents, would, who were terrific parents, would say things like, stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about. That's not exactly opening up the conversation for a discussion about feelings. And these things go from generation to generation. So my family's generation was more stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about. And then I, my generation started to have children. And from then to now, we've said things to children like, don't cry, don't be scared, when actually all those feelings are part of the human experience. And it's fine to feel those ways. What we have to teach children is what to do with that feeling. What is that feeling called? What does it feel like in your body? And here's what it's called. And now what do we do about it? One way to teach them what to do about it is to give and receive comfort. Give them comfort, receive their comfort, because that helps to teach them compassion and empathy. So try even things when they're upset. Instead of saying something like, don't cry, try saying, I'm sorry that you're sad. How can I help? Is there anything that I can do? Or if they're afraid, instead of saying, don't be scared, tell them, I know you're scared. I see that you're scared. Sometimes we're all scared. What can we do to be brave? How can I help you? They need to know that sometimes we are all sad and sometimes we're all scared and sometimes we're all angry and sometimes we're all surprised, just like sometimes we're all happy. It isn't a realistic expectation to expect children to be happy all the time. None of us are happy all the time. So what we need to do is help them to label their emotions and we can do it when they're not emotional. For example, we can sing songs with them about emotions and act out those emotions. Acting out emotions is a really important part of teaching children about acceptance of what people feel and that this is what that feeling looks like. It's what it looks like when I'm angry, I tend to make a certain face and when I'm happy, I make another face. One of the things I enjoy doing with children when I'm with children first thing in the morning is sing a version of happy and you know it, but they get to say how they feel and we have emotion with our hands for every different type of feeling. So if the child says, I'm sad today, we sing if I'm sad, if you're sad and you know it, and we have emotion that goes along with that. Because whatever word they use, whatever word they use is fine. Whatever they're feeling, we're not gonna try and change it to happy. We're gonna take the word that they use and then make it part of our song. Another way to teach children about their feelings is to use dramatic play. So I know a lot of people are home now and you may need to look around your house and think, what can I use here? Uh, socks are a terrific tool and you're gonna see them more than once in this presentation. 
creating sock puppets to show children and act, acting out of different emotions and different problems, such as taking turns or, um, you know, when you want something that somebody else has, to act that out with puppets helps children to think about the problem when they're not emotionally involved in it themselves. And we all know that it's, we do our best thinking when we're not emotionally involved ourselves. You might be surprised how easily children will tell you a solution, but can't put it into practice themselves. Very often we'll use dolls or puppets to act out a situation where one puppet wants something that the other puppet has. And we say to the children, what should they do? And all the children say, take turns. But when they're playing, they struggle to do it. So just know that the knowledge is different than being able to, to use it. And it's good to use these puppets to see where is your child's level of understanding of how to cope with the, that feeling. Point out characters' feelings when you're reading stories. Read stories about friendship and about all different sorts of feelings. They have such great children's books now. And you can also write stories. You don't even have to purchase books. We're gonna talk about writing stories with your children a little later. But know that reading about feelings and having them again examine the feelings of characters is important. So when they're really young, they have these cute little board books that show the different emotions, books about being angry or books about being happy, books about being surprised, books about being joyful. And they should look at that so that they get to know the nonverbal cues like the facial expressions. And then as they get older and you're reading books that have characters and stories, talk with them about how the characters are feeling. And then finally, use dramatic play to actually act out social situations. When you're playing with them, present them with a dilemma, with a problem that they need to solve, that they might encounter when they're in a social situation and see how they handle it. They like to do that with us. I've played with many young children who like to challenge us. They will present us with the drama. They will come and say, I want what you have when we're playing. And so what I need to do in that situation is model the reaction that we would like them to have if they were in the situation. All of these together will help your children to accept their feelings, to accept the feelings of others, and to begin to use strategies to deal with what seems to them like a very complicated situation. What I was going to say, Cindy, is that this is such an important topic right now. So I think some of those strategies, um, you know, especially around using that dramatic play, I think, and having other ways to find ways to express these emotions is so important. We did have two questions come in the chat. Mm -hmm. One was about when ch children transition from parallel play to playing with each other. So that was the okay. first question. So children go through stages of play. First, they play alone. They do solitary play. It's called solitary play, where they're just playing alone and they don't care what's happening around them. Then they will play um, parallel. And that's usually somewhere, um, somewhere in the two to three-year-old age range. Usually we see children playing parallel, which means they're using the same items, but they're not interacting with each other. So you have a child with a bunch of Legos and another child sitting nearby with a bunch of Legos, and they don't interact. They're still doing their own thing and building their own thing. And after that comes another stage before they play together. It's called associative play. They're associating, which means really that they're stealing toys from each other and yelling, ah, she took my green one and all that sort of thing. They're associating, they're taking things from each other. So I wanna to submit to you that when your children start to grab from other children, that's progress because they're moving from parallel play toward that cooperative play. But first they have to take things from each other, ask things of each other, and start to interact while they're playing. And then finally after that, they start to cooperatively play. Um, typically speaking, we don't see cooperative play until somewhere around mid pre-K to kindergarten, successfully executed themselves. And what I wanted to share is on that resource page, what you'll find is links to the CDC's developmental milestones, which really tell you great information on, you can look up the age of your child and see what other children may be doing at that age. 
I also want to point out that we all go in and out of those stages of play for the rest of our lives. So if your child uh, for a little while was cooperatively playing beautifully and now you see your child parallel playing again, that's perfectly normal. We always go in and out of these stages. There are times where I want to do things alone. There are times when I want to do something but just kind of chat with you while I'm doing it. And there are times when I want to do it with you. That's just part of being human. The other question that was really great that came in in the chat was about how to promote sharing, especially within a childcare program during these times when each child may have their you know, own group of um, activities and a kit of their own items. I've been asked this question a lot over the past couple of weeks as I work with schools as a consultant to help them get up and running. And I think that we have to start to think a little differently than we have in the past. If you're in a situation where the children actually can't share physical items, the question needs to flip from what can't they do to what can they do? What can they share? Can they share an experience though using separate items? Can they work together to create something with their individual parts that will become part of a whole? Can they um, share conversation versus something physical? You know, I think we need to start thinking outside of the share the toy box and think there are many other things that human beings share. And how can I make that possible? So I encourage you, if you're working in a setting, to think about what can I have the children do individually? I know a lot of kids are going to have their own art materials now, and they don't share the crayons, and they don't share the paper. Well, that's okay, because they can still create something that will become a part of a whole display. That's a great idea, Cindy. And I think the other piece is finding um, strategies like we're sharing today to then share back with families and parents and caregivers as well. So let's start taking a look at the next piece, which is around language development. And again, going back to what I shared before around that talking is teaching. And along with talking, language development is so much about understanding and communicating as well. Language development starts from the moment a child is born, maybe even before, say the studies. And what we wanna do from the time they're infants, those of you who are on the call who have infants, please make sure that you are doing self-talk and parallel talk. And again, this is something that will go on your entire child's entire life. So if you're on the call with a preschooler, same for you. Self-talk is when I narrate what I'm doing. So if you have a baby and you say to the baby, I'm gonna lie you down, I'm gonna lift your legs to put the diaper underneath, that's self-talk, you're narrating what you're doing. And parallel talk is when you're narrating what they're doing. And you're saying, I see you picking up the rattle and shaking it. You're making a loud sound with the rattle. This sort of talk is very important in the development of language and in comprehension. And it still goes on when you think about it when we're adults. Uh, just last night, I was sitting in the living room watching television and I said to my husband, I'm gonna get up and go get a snack. That's self-talk and the parallel talk was when my husband said something about me holding the remote control. So we still continue to do that. And that helps children who to, to communicate their wants and needs, which they do through crying in the beginning. And then it continues through naming things, short sentences, asking questions and back and forth conversation. They also communicate non-verbally. They'll point and um, gesture and make faces. And we want to encourage that. So here are some ideas for activities with the children. First, please encourage imitation. All things start with imitation. I remember when my boys were infants and they would smile and I would smile and they would coo and I would coo and I was imitating them. And then I would make a noise and they would try to imitate it and we went back and forth like that. Imitation is very important. Imitation actually happens before children can pretend. They, they need to be able to imitate. Because what is pretend if it's not imitating the world they see around them to try and understand it? Um, so they start with imitation, and I encourage imitation all along. If you have a preschool student, you want them to try and write their name, they need to watch you write the letters. If you want to encourage them to love books, they need to see you read your own books. Imitation continues throughout their lives. We also want to encourage in the fact that imitation teaches children back and forth interaction, back and forth. You do something, I'll do something. I'll do something, you do something. That back and forth is called a serve and return interaction, like a tennis match. You serve the ball and I'm going to return it. And then I'm, the next person will return it and they'll try and return it. 
We want to encourage that because that'll lead to later conversation. So serve and return interactions, again, very important. Don't forget to narrate what you're doing, which is that parallel and self-talk. As they continue to get older, you can say things to them like, I'm going to get the shovel while you hold the plant where it belongs. And that's part of that interaction of, let, of having children understand what it is you're doing and that they know you see what they're doing. We want to say what children are doing out loud. It acknowledges them and it shows them we see you and we value what you can do. I can't emphasize reading enough. Reading is so important, reading with your children. So reading, when you're reading and the children are very young, please be sure to point to things and name them. And as they get older, if there are things on the pages that you think they don't know and the pictures, continue to do that. As they get older, you can start to point to certain words and show them the word. Um, and that sort of interaction teaches them that what's on that page is what I'm talking about. Children don't necessarily know that, you know, they take, we take for granted that when we read for them, they know that we're reading what's on that page. They don't know that because they can't read yet. So they need to see the connection between what is written and what we say. By pointing things out when we read, we show them that what I'm talking about is right here on the page. I also want to point out the importance of environmental print. So environmental print are the words that children see in their environment all the time. There are things like logos on the products you use, street signs, all the things they naturally see in their environment. And environmental print is a good starting point because children recognize it. We always, when we teach children, want to start with what they already know. And I'm going to tell you some things your children already know, and I know this from working with them. They know the Amazon logo and the word Amazon. They know McDonald's. They know the names of their cereal. You will be surprised to the words they will recognize when you show them things like logos. They know the stop sign outside. They see maybe a yield sign, and you can tell them that says yield. It means you have to wait. But reading that environmental print helps them to understand the purpose of letters. When we teach letters by themselves, children don't really understand their purpose or how they connect to reading. By showing them environmental print, by saying to them, uh, when the child recognizes you, they, you go riding by a McDonald's and they go, McDonald's, and you say, that's right, McDonald's starts with M, and then you can show it to them at home. If you're home and you pull out their favorite cereal and you can say to them, what cereal is this? And they say, um, Cheerios. And you can say, that's right. Look at the S at the end of Cheerios, just like in your name. Point out letters and in their actual use. Talk with children about choices. This helps them to do some critical thinking while they're communicating. And it empowers them. It's very important to empower children. Children are constantly struggling for their power. We know that because again, one of the first words they learn is no. They look at you and they say no. That's their early childhood struggle for power. Where are my power boundaries? And there are times when no has to be no, right? And we can't give them the power, but there are times when we can give them the power and get them to understand a really important part of language development and that's the use of questions. We want children to value questions as well as the critical thinking for making decisions. Speaking of which, we want to ask questions of children about what they do. We want to ask questions about what they're playing when they're dramatically playing, and we want to ask questions about what they're creating. Allowing them to create, to sit with a blank piece of paper and just blob some paint on there, to, uh, to just scribble a drawing out, however they do it, without any instruction from an adult, it are, is very important in the development of their creativity and critical thinking skills. It helps children to become decision makers and innovators. And when they do that, we want to ask really meaningful questions. So in, think about this. Instead of saying to a child, what is that when they've painted something, let's ask them more meaningful questions like, what do you like about what you made? What's your favorite part? Or even the phrase, tell me about that, 
will give you more of a conversation with the children than say to them, what is that? What is that is usually a one word answer. They'll say it's a truck, which is good when they're really, really little, but I want more conversation for them. So the more how and why questions you can ask them about what they're doing, the better. And you know how often they ask you why? I challenge you to ask them why equally as often. I like that challenge, Cindy. And I think what I love about that last one around asking questions is the imagination and creativity of the answers you get back, which are so amazing, which when you, when you ask the question the other way, you're limiting all of that imagination and creativity. Yeah, there's a big difference between creating something to make me happy and creating something because they thought of it. Yeah, yeah. And so we did get a few questions in the chat. So one of them was about how do we change the, the language? So instead of our telling our children, don't touch that or don't do that, how can we phrase it so they understand? So this is almost a workshop for another day. So I will give you, <laughs> I will give you a, a quick hint how to do that. When we tell children don't, don't do that, they really don't know what else to do. That's the truth. They have an impulse to do something and now you've told them to stop and they don't know. When you have children in a hallway and you say, don't run, they pause and then they run again because they don't know what else to do with that impulse or that energy. What we need to tell them is what we want them to do instead. And we need to start with why. Children need to understand why I'm asking this of you. So there are three basic rules for early childhood. One is safety, another one is kindness, and another one is taking care of our things. And those three rules really cover all of the things you're gonna tell them. So let's say a child is running and you don't want them to run. You need to say, be safe, walk please. It's why, be safe, walk please. So it takes a little brain manipulation for adults. We're not used to being spoken to this way, but always be thinking about what do I need you to do instead? That's what I need to tell you. Great. And we also got a couple of questions related to being bilingual and um, learning other languages. So how can we help or assist parents who are bilingual continue to teach their children? And how healthy is it for little ones to learn multiple languages at home? It's wonderful for children to learn multiple languages at home. You know, that's something we didn't always know. And I'll, honestly, in the beginning of my career, we didn't always know the, we didn't know the value of it. But now there are so many studies out there that talk about the value of children doing that. And in fact, there are certain parts of the brain, certain brain development that is advanced in children who learn more than one language when they're very young because they have to develop critical thinking skills very young to code through multiple languages. So yes, we want to encourage people who speak another language at home to do that. So what we need to do is provide people um, who are bilingual, bilingual with instructions and information that they can follow and then do in their home language. There's no reason why the children can't experience the same experiences in both languages. Yeah, and I think what we can do to support some of that is on that resource page, we're gonna add some tools that can support those that will be, that are dual language learners and support some of that learning at home. Great. So looking at cognitive development, so you know the thing that comes to mind is to think about putting aside some of those letter and number worksheets and really think of cognitive development in terms of exploration and discovery. You know, something that comes to mind is yesterday I was going for a walk with the five-year-old and the freight train went by. And it was such a great opportunity to talk about shapes and colors, but wasn't done in a way where we're saying, all right, you know, start tracing this rectangle or what are those colors on there? It was done in a way that just felt like play and conversation. We do want their skill development for cognitive skills to be natural. And just to explain the cognitive skills are the things that adults often call literacy, math, science, social studies. It's those subject areas are a lot of the cognitive skills. Also part of cognitive skills are critical thinking, problem solving, and decision making. So we, we need to build these skills. Children have experiences from the time they're born. And we're constantly gonna try and add to those experiences. In order to develop this, we need to build upon what they already know. That's why, as I mentioned, environmental print, I mentioned it earlier, they already know that box of cereal and they already know that stop sign. So I can take that 
and build on it by adding some information to what they already know. And children need to be interested in what they're doing. And just like Nuthan said, worksheets, please put them away for a while, put them away because they're not interesting to children. They may want to accomplish it because they like making adults happy, but do something that really interests them. What do the children love? And then kind of bounce off that. Give them time to explore that and add information and let them lead the way a little bit. Watch how they're playing. Children are natural explorers and scientists and natural mathematicians. They naturally are interested in letters because of their own names. And we can build upon that with some of the interactions that you have with them at home and some of the materials that are easy for you to access at home. So we're gonna go back to this environmental print and consider when they're sitting and doing something like eating breakfast, you see cereal boxes in this picture. Understanding colors and shapes or mathematics skills and geometry. So sit there and talk about while they're eating, just talk about the box that they're looking at and what colors they're seeing, what shapes, what letters, have a conversation based on what they're looking at. You don't need expensive fancy blocks to have your children practicing engineering, physics, and creative skills. All you need are those empty paper towel rolls or toilet paper rolls. And children will naturally create and build um, and put things together. And when they do, watch them. They are being architects and innovators and designers. Water is a great resource to use for science experiments. Water, usually pretty readily available. Um, and we can use it for so many things. We put on this slide, evaporating and freezing are two examples of things you can do with water. To show evaporation, you put some water in a Ziploc bag, tape it to a window that gets sunlight, and you'll see the droplets that form on the side of the bag. You can also do things like sinking and floating experiments dissolving things in water, what dissolves and what doesn't dissolve. Water is a great tool for doing all sorts of science. Scavenger hunts teach children decision-making and critical thinking skills, and they show you what information the children recall. So let's say you're trying to teach your children a particular shape or a number or something, and you want them to find things. First, they're gonna to have to recall what it means, and then they're gonna to have to use that to problem solve and figure out where it might be. So scavenger hunts are a really cool way to check skill levels, um, as well as adding some of those critical thinking skills. Puzzles are important too. Puzzles not only are for fine motor development as they pick up the pieces, but they teach children spatial relationships and they teach children problem solving. You can very easily make puzzles. You don't have to buy them. Again, back to boxes, any kind of product box so that the children will recognize cereal boxes are great for this. You take the front of the box, turn it over, draw some lines of where you're gonna cut, cut it apart into a puzzle. And then children can put it back together because they already know what it looks like. I encourage you very much to write books with your children from the time they're very young. We are all so busy with our smartphones taking pictures. If you can, print some of those pictures out and create picture books for your young children based on what you actually do, based on your family and what's in your home and what you actually do. And then as they get older, you can add some words to it. They can tell you what they wanted to say and you write that down so they get to see you writing and they get to see that what they said is what you've written. And eventually they'll be able to trace letters and write letters on their own as they head more toward pre-K and kindergarten. You have a lot of materials in your home that also teach math. Socks and shoes are some of them. They can help you sort. So you know what, it's laundry day, get them involved. Have them help put clothes in size order too as you're going through and taking the laundry out of the dryer maybe or putting it in rooms. Have them help you sort your groceries as you put them away. Involve them in your activities in the kitchen. And have them help you do things around the house like setting the table. Setting the table is what's called one-to-one -one correspondence because for every one chair, we're gonna put one plate. And for every one chair, we're gonna put one fork. And that's the beginning of higher math skills. I think that what shows in so many of those examples is that these are just like everyday things that you're doing together. So, you know, when I look at those, I often think about our family unloading the dishwasher 
And we're all, you know, part of that. And there are so many different opportunities there for all of these, for language, for interaction, and for those teachable moments as well. Absolutely. We did get a few more uh, questions in the chat, a couple of them actually related to language. Um, so how do you help develop words for an 18 month old? By demonstrating the use of words um, and by encouraging them to communicate with you. So, you know, at 18 months, they're starting to develop word usage, show them lots of picture books and things, talk about, again, that self and parallel talk, talk about what they're using and holding and name things and encourage them to name it as best they can. Yeah, and I think to your, you know, your point, always reading, um, you know, always reading, reading finding their interests mm -hmm. and building upon that. And talking about what they're doing. They love what they're doing. So talk about, they're very interested in their own actions. So talk about that. And then another question about how to deal with tantrums in an 18 month old. Okay, so there are two different things. There are meltdowns and tantrums. A meltdown comes from being overtired and overwrought and overstimulated. And a tantrum is more, the source of that is more anger. So I'll share with you very briefly in the interest of time that my second child, who's now an adult, and, and believe me, they grow up anyway, was a tantrum thrower. He had tantrums a lot. And what we realized, we sought some help for it, what we learned and realized pretty early on was that my son reacted very quickly to his own emotions. That was what was causing the tantrum. That his body, in his body, he reacted very quickly to his own emotions. What happens when you're upset is that you start to breathe shallow. So your heart rate increases, sends a message to the brain that there's an emergency, and then adrenaline and epinephrine and all sorts of stress hormones stream through your body, and that literally turns off the thinking part of the brain. So what do we need to do is teach children some things about what it feels like when they're upset and to take deep breaths. From the time they're very young, have them imitate your deep breaths. They can do it when they're 18 months old. I've done it with them. So you take a deep breath and have them imitate it when they are not upset, like a game. So that when you see that they're getting upset, you go over and make that same face, make eye contact, make that same face and get, take deep breaths. And if you have practice imitation, they will imitate. But just know, please, that tantrums are just, it's, I feel a lot of uh, empathy for children who are having a tantrum because they themselves can't control it and they themselves are out of control. And once it starts, you just have to go through it to the other side. Their tantrum has to just sort of burn itself out. A time frame I've found is really great for those breathing exercises is when you might be laying in bed together, because then you're already laying down and you can really practice that belly breathing. So you can really feel it. If they're putting their hands on their belly and they feel their belly going up and down, then they're really taking those breaths. You can also put uh, like one of their favorite toys or stuffed animals on their belly and they can watch it go up and down as they breathe. That's a great idea. So we'll move to physical and motor development and then come back to some of these great questions that are coming in in the chat. So of course, with physical and motor development, thinking about everything from crawling, squeezing, grasping, jumping, hopping, and you know all those great things that come along with it. And it starts at the bottom of this staircase. It starts with their ability to control their head, then goes to the neck and the trunk. And from the trunk of your body, the muscles develop outward toward the fingers and toes. So first it's the trunk, then the arms and legs, then the fingers and toes. And here are some ideas. So because we're starting with the head and the neck, that's why tummy time for young babies is so important. It's very important that they spend time lying down on their tummies and practice lifting up their heads and then lifting up their bodies with their arms and arching that trunk of their body. When you have them down for tummy time, that's terrific one-to-one -one conversation time to lay on the floor with them and talk to them while they're trying to lift up. And that eventually becomes taking those long walks together, which we can still do even during this challenging time. Hopefully the weather will be cool enough now for a while where you're comfortable taking walks and talking with your children about what they're seeing and doing. Those walks are a very important part of motor development, as is playing ball or anything where you are releasing an object and then taking it back in, releasing and grasping. That's why we want children to do things like kicking, catching, and throwing. 
pushing and pulling are another important gross motor skill. And I know you don't want your children opening doors when they shouldn't be opening doors. So we need to make sure our doors are set up so that they can't open it when they shouldn't be opening it. But it is important that they push and pull doors. So please give them the opportunity to do that. And they can also push and pull other things in your home, boxes, wagons, ropes. I know I'm getting a lot of deliveries now. I have a lot of boxes that kids could just kind of play with in the course of their play, push and pull. The traveling skills are things like running, hopping, skipping. And skipping, by the way, is a developmental skill. And so we, we expect children to skip actually somewhere around the age of four. They don't skip till around their fourth birthday. So don't worry so much about skipping. Concentrate more on the hopping and the running and the jumping. And then they'll put that all together to skip. Fine motor skills, the skills in their fingers, the muscles in their fingers. They can use cotton swabs to paint. If you don't have paint, just use water. They can paint with water on a table or on paper. Makes a lot less of a mess. And they really do enjoy that. Figure out what you have in your house that they can use to pinch, whether it's squirt bottles, tweezers, droppers. We want to see their hands going in and out of a fist and in and out of trying to get their fingers together. To strengthen the muscles, you can do something like leaf rubbings. Grab things from nature and do things. So leaf rubbings are really, not only are they cute when you put the leaf underneath the piece of paper and the children take the crayon and rub and rub and rub, it takes some strength of the hand, the fingers, and the arms to do that. Modeling with clay, Play-Doh, homemade Play-Doh. There's lots of recipes online with simple ingredients. That's a very important development of the muscles in their fingers. So when you see children using Play-Doh, they're not only playing, they're developing the muscles that they will need in order to write later on. And then finally, Ripping, tearing, all of those things. So we tend to try and aim right for scissors, but that's not the first step. The first step is the children's ability to rip. They need to be able to rip. So, and children come to preschool all the time not knowing how, because it's hard, because they have to do an opposite motion. Opposite motions are hard. So start them with ripping, tearing, snipping, and cutting. Collect a bin of scrap paper, junk mail, whatever you have, and that can be their ripping, tearing, snipping, cutting bin. I was laughing when you're talking about the Amazon boxes. I think the Amazon boxes in, in our life have been used for everything from a car to a bed mm -hmm. to a house for, you know, his favorite lovey. Absolutely. And, and I know what people are thinking now, if it's not already in the Q&A and in the chat, it's when do I do all of this? This is a question I'm asked all the time when I teach people what to do with children. So here are some tips uh, that may help you. Please know that routine is very important to young children. Uh, it's important that you establish a routine, even during these crazy times. Routines, children are very comforted by having something they know they can predict what's going to happen. It has consistency and it has structure. But at the same time, you need to be adaptable and flexible. So let's say part of your routine is we're going to um, sit and do puzzles, but your child is not in the mood today. Be adaptable and flexible and go to something else. So you can have time like within the routine where things change. So it's part of our routine that this time of day we spend playing together. And then what you do in that play can change. Don't forget to make time for personal care routines, meals, snack, rest. When you're figuring out what is our schedule of the day going to look like, don't neglect those things because they do take up time. When the weather's nice, please get them outdoors as much as possible. Children can learn so much from being out in nature. And try and alternate active and quiet activities. Children don't do well when they sit for too long. So if they've been inside with you, maybe you've been sitting and doing puzzles, after that is a great time to go outside and run around. And then they'll be more apt to come in and listen to your book. When we alternate like that, it helps them out. Please take time to read every day. If you can, at least twice a day is great. And allow them the time to be creative and pretend. For way too long, we have looked at that as a waste of time. It is the opposite of a waste of time. It is how they figure out their world. Children are not just playing. They're playing to learn. And I hope that you keep that in mind. A few more questions that have come up in the chat. So one question was, 
how important is it for an 18 month old to be around other children for developmental reasons when considering whether they should go to childcare or not? I think that's a, an excellent question for our times. You know, we know that best practice is that children get a chance to interact with each other and then there are health and safety concerns. I think that interaction, I, I, if we keep in mind during this time, this crazy time that we're living in, that interaction really matters with whomever it is. So they need the time to interact with their most important adults. If you are able, if you cannot be with other children and you are able to use software like we're using now to have children interact virtually, that's very good. Have them send things back and forth, even videos that they can watch over and over. If you are able, if you have people who are part of your COVID pod, where you know everybody is being safe, then go ahead and do that. But I think ultimately this is a very personal decision, how much time um, you're going to have your child spend with other children right now. And I get that you may make a multiple decisions. So just think about what are some ways I can have my child see and even virtually interact with others. That's great advice. Another one that came in around um, language development is what age should you start challenging the questions? And I believe that's saying challenging the questions that the child is asking. So I, I, I think I'll, I'll answer that by saying this. When children ask you why, it's because they want to know why. And I think too many times, and I, I'll, myself as a parent too, I'm sure, because my kids were little and I was busy. I was a busy working mom. And I, I'm sure that there were times where they asked why, where I just thought, oh my goodness, I cannot answer this question at a time. And I didn't challenge their questions to me. I think it's very important to answer their questions. To go back and ask them questions and challenge them in that way should be happening from the time they're infants. Before they can verbally answer you, maybe they can point. And before they can do that, you ask and you answer. They should always be hearing questions. One of the things that there was a study, it was a terrific study, and it showed that children struggle with the value of curiosity and questions because when they're very little, they don't see adults as curious and they don't think that that's a value. So there was a study that was done and what they realized was children actually ask the most questions per day when they're about four years old. And then by the time they're five, they stop asking. And it's a few things that cause that. One is they don't see it as an adult value, and now they're starting to become aware of behaving in a little more grown-up way by the time they're five. So they think, if I ask a question, that's not what grown-ups do. Another thing is that they haven't experienced that questions are good. They're, they become afraid or that they're going to look like they don't know things. They become aware of the reaction of others. So if we answer their questions because we value them. And then we ask them a question. They learn questions are good and curiosity is good. Thanks, Cindy. And there's a couple of just really great ideas in the chat. One is around great. those paint strips and using those for cutting. And another one is, is a great idea around really cooking activities and baking together and all of the development that can happen within those activities as well. Yeah, cooking with your children, I can't, overstate that either. It's so valuable. Think about what they're doing. They're following directions. They're measuring. They're participating in a cooperative um, activity. All very, very important. And as you can see here on your screen, we're asking that you visit the resource page if you're looking for other tools and ideas and other activities. Um, we will be including some resources around supporting dual language learners that you support and also will include some translated slides in Spanish as well. And you'll see that in the chat now is the direct link to that resource page. And um, Cindy, any last words before we kind of close it out? Oh, you know, I can't resist last words. So, so here <laughs> are my last words. This is also an opportunity um, where, um, you know, any of you have some, you know, last minute questions, feel free to throw those into the chat as well. So here are my last words. You, um, I encourage you during this time when we're so stressed and torn and, and feel so out of control to dive into the play with your children and enjoy every minute of it. Every minute of it is a learning opportunity for them and every minute of it creates memories that they will value. So I hope that you will dive in. As the parent of, of children who are adults now, 
uh, I'll share with you that as much as you, you are busy and you are struggling, I miss those days. That, that is good advice. And um, one other question that's come up is how can we help a child calm down and breathe when they might be really mad each time you ask them to take a breath? Let them know that when they're ready, you'll do it. Give them a little control. Children need some control. So there are times where I'll say to angry children, breathe with me, and they'll say no. And I'll say to them, okay, that's okay. When you're ready, we'll do it. Let me know. Let me know. And do you know how often I've looked at little children and said, when you're ready, and they go, I'm ready. They just needed to make the decision themselves. Hand over yeah, some decisions, folks. And I think to your point before is working on some of those skills when they're not already upset can be really valuable because then it transfers into those other times. Yes, absolutely. Hopefully they'll remember and be able to apply it. Yes. And what I just want to say is, you know, when we're speaking of breathing anyway, I think even as parents and caregivers for us to remember to also keep breathing through this. And I'd like to just add on um, an action item um, along with what Seal presented before, which is, you know, for today to find one of those teachable moments or meaningful interactions that you can have with the child in your life um, using the items that you have around your home. And Seal, I'll send it back to you. Great. Well, thank you. Um, please, I, I wish there were a way to send applause virtually. I know there's the clapping hands, but I just want to thank both of you for what has been a very informative and engaging session. Um, as a grandmother who is planning grandma camp next week for <laughs> a four-year-old and a new six-year-old, I'm really, there's some really great ideas. Um, and I think the, the closing, Cindy, of just have fun was, was a great way to end. So thank you both. I hope every, I know looking at the chat box, many, many positive comments and people who found this informative. For those of you who want further information, I know uh, we've put up information in the chat room. This has been recorded. You'll be able to access this recording shortly. We're gonna send it out to everybody who signed up for the webinar. Um, there were links to getting the slides that Nuthan and Cindy presented. Um, so lots of opportunity to continue the conversation. Um, and I would ask you, if you're interested in other topics that you'd like to see covered or dig a little deeper into one of these, email us at ACNJ um, and we'll see what we can help arrange. I think these have been a great learning and outreach experience for us too. So thank you all for joining us today and a special thanks to Nuthan and Cindy and to uh, the center at Rutgers for partnering with us in this and the other programs we've done. Have a great day, everyone.